Hello Arcadians and welcome to This Week in Retro. High resolution color graphics. This land of high technology. The revolution in technology that made the information age possible. Those kids are not afraid of computers. Amiga, an alternative reality. The perfect PC. OMG, USB, BBC, ATX, RGB. You're in the place to be. All this and more on This Week in Retro up-to-date news for out-of-date tech. Hello, welcome to another episode of This Week in Retro. It's show 102 and we've got a very special guest once again with us and this time he's got hair. It's Alex from the Arcade Archive. Thanks for joining us, Alex. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> How have you been, Alex? Because you've been working so hard over these last few months and a question, you know, I see you almost every day in the mill because for those who don't know, Alex has set up an arcade museum called the Arcade Archive in the same building as the cave um, and he's been working flat out for the last few months to get this ready and I haven't asked you yet, how are you feeling? Because you've reached the finishing stage, it's now open to the public, have you had time to let it all sink in? Yeah, it's been a hell of a lot of work and you know, some days it's been quite stressful, <laughs> but yeah. seeing it all come together and actually seeing people walk through that door it was an amazing day. What was it? A couple of weeks ago, we had the soft launch, didn't we? And seeing the whole arcade yeah. full of people was amazing. And I just hope every weekend it's going to be like that, you know, because um, we put so much work into the arcade and we've got yeah, so many amazing into- games. It's not until people walk in that you really know if the space is going to work or not. We had it in our heads, like, this is how we're going to lay it out. This is how people will flow around. But until you actually put, as I've said in a previous episode of mine, until you put the meat in the retro sandwich, you don't quite know <laughs> how, how it's going to behave in there. And yeah. um, it works pretty well as a space, doesn't it? Yeah, and it's interesting seeing what games people like playing because I have put some real obscurities in there. You know, will people just walk past them? have no interest they just go straight to the classics the ones they remember but you know it's last saturday we had people in there and they were just one guy was just playing each and every single game and he got halfway around and he said to me i've only got another half an hour left i haven't done it all (laughs) yet so it was like (laughs) wow you know yeah really appreciated every game and, and got right into every one of them and that was amazing to see you know. That's the ideal visitor. You want people yes. who will appreciate each piece as its own little bit of history uh, and take it in because you've put signage up to tell people about the history of the machines. It, you know, it really is the, the 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 beginning of it all for you. I know you've still got to work out more how the space works and and how to add extra to visitors, the kind of stories you want to tell people, the the things you want to pull out the cupboards to show people to surprise them and, and teach them about things. So um, it's been a real joy to see you bring it all together and it open. And I'm sure we'll talk about it a bit more uh, as the episode goes on today. Uh, but for anyone who uh, wants to come and visit the Arcade Archive, it is um, currently you go to rmcretro.store. And then in the coming weeks, we're going to have a new website set up, especially for it. So you're just going through my website for now. But rmcretro.store, if you want to grab yourself a ticket, um, Alex is open. Well, right now, when this show goes out, um, yeah. <laughs> this show goes out at 10 a.m. on just a drive Saturday. Down. Just drive down. Yeah. Don't you so, <laughs> There's an Turn afternoon up. session, two o'clock, get a ticket, get down there. You've seen there. Neil sent you. Yeah, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> um, Chris, tell us about your week. How have you been getting on this week? Not too bad. I've got, I've got huge news, right? It's, it's it's a running joke, you know. There was a, there was a particular car that Dave uh, mentioned in a, in an episode not long ago, um, and and Dave, you mentioned that it was designed by Pinaferina, and the running if joke I was, you know, I keep saying, yeah. you know, I I I I kept saying that I wanted to buy one at some stage. There, it you know, can be incredibly expensive, of course. Um, well, in the show notes, I've actually put a photo of a Pinaferina badge, and that is on the side of my car. I didn't buy a red one; I bought a black one. Dave, you've seen the photos. What do you reckon? I I, I was shocked when I saw the photos at the car, and and, and at the color. I thought, if you're going to buy that car, why not red? Yeah, well, that's that true. That particular go... car belongs Neil's in red. Jump, Neil's jumping up and down. Neil, can I take a guess at what car you've bought? Because I don't know what you've bought. Well, what car were we discussing with a Pinaferina badge on it? It's a diesel Skoda. I was going to say a Peugeot because <laughs> P- Pinaferina have done Peugeots. They did like the Peugeot Coupe. Didn't they? <laughs> oh, oh they did got? too. They did too. Yeah, you're right. It's not a Ferrari Testarossa at all. <laughs> it's, it's not a Peugeot, though. Um, it's it's an Alfa Romeo GTV. And in fact, I, oh, I pre... Nice. <laughs> hang on, hang you on. You see that as if it's bad? That's good. Yeah, hang on. Yeah, is it a V6? It's very nice. 
No, oh, so spark. I wish it was the V6. I see the yeah, it's a twin spark. And and funnily enough, this actually used to be my car. I sold it to one of my boys. They had it as their first car, and the deal was always that when they got bored of it, they uh, or you know got over the the running costs of it, should I say, um, they'd offer it back to me as first dibs. So that's what's happened. So I've got it again. It's fantastic. Just puts a smile nice. on my face. Can't explain why. Lovely. So, so yeah. for, I mean, I'm sure Duncan will put a picture up, but just for listeners, just just describe this beautiful car, Chris black that's all you need to know black is beautiful um it's it's a wedge basically oh wedges come up later on in today's it's episode got furry actually, dice. It's, it's a black wedge <laughs> doesn't have furry dice and funny enough doesn't have the leather interior which these usually has uh, have it has the cloth which is actually better for the heat in perth um are those yeah. are those um telly dial alloy wheels is that what they're called no, they're the the telly dials are the ones that are sort of more protruded on the circles. Okay. So, um, but yeah, similar design. But this this when we first bought this car, it had seventeen inch five spoke rims, which looked so boy racer. So I went to the hassle of finding somebody getting rid of. Oh, I think I actually got those for free or for cheap. No, it's for free. I gave the guy some drinks in exchange. Um, so the original nice. look as if it's on it. a rotary phone. You could, He's, yeah, yeah. that's why some people wheels. call them the telly dials, yeah. But actual yeah. telly dials, they're, they're sort of more protruded on the circle. They're really nice wheels, actually, if you can get hold of them. They're fantastic. They're the sort of right, anyway. We're not talking about so, cars. yeah. So, it's... just if you're listening <laughs> and you can't see the picture, basically, imagine a Fiat coupe with an alpha badge. No, it's not a Fiat car. coupe. <laughs> oh, how do we mute Neil? Can we mute Neil? <laughs> One of the guys at work had those and he loved it. He, he wouldn't stop talking about his, how, how much he loved this car. I can't explain Fiat it. Coupe. I can't explain. Oh, the Fiat Coupe. No, I can't explain that either. (laughs) (laughs) Dave, what have you been up to? Well, there is a popular submission that we're not going to pick as a main story, but we should talk about. Neil has been in the newspapers, and not in a bad way, not in a cage this beast way. He's been in the Guardian. Why have you been in the Guardian, Neil? Oh, this was very last minute. So the the Guardian reached out to me because they were doing a story on people who won't give up retro technology. So they had an old guy with like 50,000 VHS tapes or something who recorded every single rugby game that would ever been broadcast. Um, They had (laughs) someone who wouldn't give up their Walkman, someone who wouldn't give up their typewriter. And then the the reporter contacted me and said, the editor wants one more person for the story. Can can you be it very quickly? Okay, so... (laughs) So they they said to me, "Can you can you tell us how about how you won't give up your Atari? W- which Atari? I, Any Atari? Uh, I don't all know. They're all great. Which one? <laughs> Precious. Yeah. And then the reporter's like, "Well, I don't really know much about computers." So I said, "Well, you probably mean the wood grain, you know, the, the iconic VCS or twenty six hundred. So let's go with that." So just a little bit of spiel about that, and that went in alongside the others. Um, I think you know the story passed under the radar because most of the comments and any flack on that story were directed at VHS guy who made the mistake of saying, I love my VHSs. The picture quality is better than DVD. (laughs) Oh no. (laughs) (laughs) And of course everybody tore into that. It was fun. It It made my mum proud. That's, that's the only reason I go with stories in the paper and stuff. If I'm asked. I watched, I watched a video last night that showed VHSs that were better than DVD. And I'm not oh, joking. It, was this Tech Man? Was it with his HD mm. or someone was doing HD VHS? Linus, right? Linus, Linus Tech Tips. All um, oh, right. They, 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 on digital VHS, it's incredible stuff. One eighty, one eighty i. This is digital than data. DVD. Digital data on VHS tapes, which yeah. te- technically there's no reason why you couldn't do that. Yeah, well, um, they did. How, how much? How much length could you get on a VHS in digital? Well, they, they were looking at a film. They, they bought a film. There was four versions. They bought the VHS, the DVD, the digital VHS, and they bought the the Blu-ray. And um, I think the film was two minutes, two hours and twenty six minutes. So, oh, okay, long decent, enough. Decent Aye. length on there. Yeah, yeah, ah, good. And it was Anything much else? better than DVD. And in fact, it was better than Blu-ray, as if they'd mastered it badly. <laughs> I, I don't um, get why people collect VHS unless they're like horror movies. I, I get that because that you get that grainy feel when watching a horror true. movie, and it just adds that's to true. it. But why would you want to watch yeah. something like I don't know Star Wars on an old VHS? I've got no idea. The thing <laughs> I do what, like uh, about VHS is the boxes. It's like the Neo yeah. Geo shock boxes. Yeah. They look nice yeah. on the shelf. Bigger. Yeah, um, yeah that's true. they should have kept that format for DVDs. <laughs> so sometimes, Not as good as like. Laser, though. Star Wars trilogy, the only way to watch it before they messed about with it because they've made so many changes is VHS. Because as yeah, soon as it true. went to DVD, they'd there change go, some yeah. of the scenes and stuff. So there's, there's a reason. Hand yeah. shot first. 
Mm. There we go. Yes. Now, Dave, I know it's first. your um, it's your favourite part of the show. It's housekeeping. Is there any housekeeping to be had? Yeah. So, thank you very much for the feedback on last show. I asked you to to give some feedback. How do you felt about the longer show? It ended up being about ninety minutes. So about 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 half as long again as a normal episode. Um, mostly positive feedback. Um, so we won't we won't be doing ninety minute shows. We're not going to move to that format. We'll stick at sixty minutes just for the sake of logistics. It's it, it, it's not it's not easy for us to do longer than that all the time, especially poor Duncan who has to edit it. Um, but now and then we might do a bit longer. Um, thank you very much for the feedback, though. Certainly, Jason could have talked for hours too, as I thoroughly enjoyed talking <laughs> to him. Super interesting guy. Yeah, loads yeah. of things to talk about. Um, and had Neil been there and not doing his normal, right, move on, move on, move on. Had Neil <laughs> not been there doing that, I'm sure we could have talked all day. It, love talking to him. Great guy. Yeah, um, I'm really quite sorry that I missed the chance to hang out with you guys and Jason. Um, it was a great show. Um, and I don't think there was a single comment that said, we miss you, Neil. Thanks, guys. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we missed you. And didn't we, Dave? I think I think people, Neil, heard what I said about you being busy and stressed out and thought, I, admit, I do miss Neil, but I don't want to make him feel bad by saying it. I think they, were, <laughs> yeah. they, were, they all missed you, Neil. They just didn't uh, want to say it. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. And if there are any <laughs> listeners out there, um, I was just thinking as Dave was doing his housekeeping, if there are any musicians out there who want to do a jingle for Dave's housekeeping, I'd love to add that to the show. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Banjo guy, Ollie. <laughs> we are sponsored by Pixel Addict Magazine. Pixel Addict Magazine is a monthly printed magazine available probably wherever you are in the world, or you can get the digital edition as a PDF. Um, it's not just about games, it's about the whole um, retro culture that we all know and love. Um, the latest issue I've been looking at, and the latest issue cover is a real work of art. I really, really like the cover. I'll describe it to you uh, for listeners uh, as best as I can. It is a desktop, and on there, there is a wooden desktop, and on there, there is a map, a magnifying glass. There is an old portable television, looks to be about a 12-inch television, Outside the window, which is the back, you can see snow on the trees and the ground. And there's Christmas lights there because the Christmas issue. And on the television is The Hobbit, the loading screen from The Hobbit. It's a wonderful picture. And of course, there is a single gold unadorned ring there. The one ring is on the cover as well. The cover is great. I love the cover. And the cover is about the, the main article they have this month in it. Neil. There's also a lamp. Don't forget the lamp. Get lamp. Oh, yeah, there's a lamp. Of course, there's a lamp. Yeah. I love and lamp. It, it is the lamp from Get Lamp, or an attempt to look like the lamp from Get Lamp, uh, from Zork and all the rest of it. Um, the Muscle Cave. Yes, and Zork. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I've interrupted um, your flow there. <laughs> um, the main story uh, is about adventures and RPGs on, on on computers. Huge, big, long story. And in part of it, they actually interview Veronica Megler, who I spoke about a few months ago when we talked about the, the anniversary of The Hobbit. Um, great article, uh, great magazine. Thank you very much for sponsoring us. And talking about beautiful pictures, I have in my hand my calendar for next year. Oh, thanks, which Dave. is... Um, supporting the long table neil you're responsible for this who are the long table uh so the long table are a group who um alex and i actually went to see on thursday of this week for a little catch-up because they've got other retro related plans coming up next year but we won't spoil those just yet um it is a, 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 a there's a another mill down the road from us where there is a collective of charities and the long table is one of the groups that are in there. And the long table is what it says it is. It is a long table on which food is served and they try to tackle food equality. So you pay what you can. If you can't pay anything, you still get fed. And um, it's a chance not only to, to be fed, but also to connect with other people and socialize and not be lonely if you're feeling lonely and um, actually see, you know, if you just want to chat, great. But if you're, you know, you, you don't know what opportunities come out of chatting with other people and connecting and where it might take your your life and what directions you might go in, 
if you can just be surrounded by people and it offers that big group family feeling to have a meal and make connections with people it's really important and they're um they're doing a great job so 100 percent of all the sales from the calendar this year the theme of which is control freaks so it's got lots of cool pictures of joysticks in the calendar 100 percent of the sale goes to the long table in fact if we're being technical more than 100 percent because we're covering the costs of the platform fees to sell it and um, uh, oneclickprint.com have very kindly printed all of the calendars at their own cost. So thank you to One Click Print. And if you want to pick up a calendar for yourself, head over to rmcretro.store where you can find it. So thank you for that. Um, and Pixel Addict is pixel.addict.media if you want to go and check out their magazines. Right, should we get into this week's stories? Let's do it. Are you all ready for an Amiga loving? I know Dave is. <laughs> what if Commodore hadn't died in 1994? What might we have seen next from the company? It's a question I know Dave obsesses over on a daily basis, as do many Amiga fans, often coming to different conclusions in this hypothetical scenario. But when Dave Haney, Commodore engineer from 1983 through to 1994, when he plays this game, I think it's worth sitting up and listening. This was a popular link uh, this week shared by listener Constant. Thank you for submitting this to our subreddit. And in the article he submitted, um, I, I have to admit, I can't see a date on the article, so I don't know exactly how old this is um, or isn't. I looked really hard. I just couldn't see a date on it. But nevertheless, it's really interesting to hear these thoughts from Dave Haney. Now, at the time Commodore went bankrupt in 1994, their most recent product included the, the budget tier Amiga 1200, um, although, what, what was it? About four hundred pounds, wasn't it? Three nine nine or four nine nine? So, you know, budget, but not super budget. Uh, but it was the the lowest cost point of entry into the current generation of Amigas at the time. At the high end, you had the Amiga four thousand, and then you had the CD thirty two games console. Actually, the CD thirty two was cheaper than the twelve hundred. But if you wanted to make it a computer, you'd be spending a lot more on keyboards and mice and things like that. So, around about the same level. So that was the lineup. 1200, 4000 CD32. And many considered that lineup to be too little too late compared to the rising power and multimedia capabilities of the IBM PC compatibles. And what would come next, the gaming capabilities of a generation of 3D focused consoles. Remember 1994, when uh, Commodore went bankrupt, was the same year that the PlayStation came out in Japan towards the end of the year. So, what could have been? Well, this is a really interesting article that doesn't shy away from the technical. So I do encourage you to get stuck into it and use the link in the show notes to read this and have a good read. But here are some of the highlights of the things that Dave was working on. And remember, it's not our Dave, it's Dave Haney and how things could have panned out. I don't the, do any work. <laughs> the Amiga 4000. So first of all, Dave describes this as a last minute thing. What we should have got was the A3000 Plus. This would have had a Motorola 68030 CPU as standard with plans to up that quite shortly afterwards to an 040. But more importantly, an AT&T branded DSP, a secondary processor. So the DSP or digital signal processor, that's a specialized processor designed specifically for jobs like audio or image processing. And given the interest in video editing and effects on the Amiga, remember the reputation that the Amiga got thanks to the video toaster, um, given the reputation it was it was getting, this DSP could have cemented the platform as the place to do that kind of thing. Um, Dave says that the DSP chip could perform these specialized tasks at 10 times the speed of a 68040 alone. And this platform was ready in 1991. So that could have been huge. Um, the, there's nothing in his writing about the specifics of the cost of this, whether it was viable, but it must have been to have got to the point of prototyping, testing, firing the thing up. So yeah, that, that could have been huge. Um, so that was your powerhouse option, the 3000 plus or what it should have been. Alongside that, Dave, not our Dave, says Commodore was working on a, a, an A1000 plus. So the Amiga 1000 was the first Amiga. In fact, it was just called the Amiga to begin with, but we knew it as the 1000. That was the first Amiga. And the 1000 Plus was to be a low profile desktop case with CPU modules that could swap out Zorro slots. So you could add things into it and a sub $1,000 price tag. So this would have been, I guess it would have been our Amiga 500 replacement instead of the A600 that nobody wanted at the time. Although it's still, you know, nearly double the price at $1,000. However, we are moving into the territory when people are stretching to IBM PC compatibles, and they certainly 
were very rarely under a thousand dollars at this point. So, you know, it competes. I, I, well, it would have competed, I think. It would have had the ability to upgrade the CPU with CPU slots. It would have had the ability to add add on cards, which you could do with the wedge shaped Amigas, but you know, it was much more attractive to have internal upgrade options, I think, and, and that flexibility. So I think that was an attractive proposition, the 1000 plus. We don't know why it was canned, but it was. Um, and then if we go back further again, Dave worked on something called the Amiga 5000. And that was um, dubbed as having the AAA architecture, this, this fabled thing that we often hear about. This is what should have resulted in the next gener generation of Amiga in 1991. So instead, what we got was AA, which would be renamed AGA. So that's what we got, that whole chipset that kind of fell short of our expectations. But we should have had this AAA thing. Um, and I guess if you integrate that with the talk of the 3000 plus and the DSP, you know, this was 24 bit graphics. This was high resolution. This was going to be a real powerhouse. And that's, that's the point you start from um, with your, with your powerhouse. And then you cost reduce it down for your 1000 plus or for your wedge or whatever, you know, you need these high end systems. And if you cut corners there, then you end up with a, a poorer product range for it. And then finally, Dave, not our Dave, talks about the Ombre chipset, a mythical part of Amiga's history, which um, I've heard former Commodore UK MD Dave Pleasance talk about. I think it was about 2018, 2019. I was in, at an expo and um, I had to chuckle because he said the Ombre chipset would have been as powerful as today's modern consoles. Yeah, in, in 2018. So um, I think that's out of the realms of possibility, you know, uh, something that's over... 20 years, 25 years old, being as powerful as present <laughs> consoles in 2019. But, you know, he was a salesman, so um, we'll, we'll let him have that. Um, so the Ombre chipset would have appeared around 1993. In a perfect world, I guess that too could have made it into the 3000 plus or maybe, as, you know, the 4000 or whatever. But um, it could perhaps have appeared as an add-on card um, or it could have appeared in the cost-reduced CD32 to make it a competitor. Um, what, what the Ombre was, by the way, it, it was pretty much a full fat GPU. It had 3D instructions and it had a RISC CPU in there. Sound familiar? You know, that's kind of the direction we went for the rest of the 90s, G dedicated GPUs and, um, you know, eventually ARM processors. Um, you know, there's a huge amount more in this article. It's a lovely, lovely read. And it's great to read the stories from someone who knows exactly what was going on behind clo closed doors. So... Just some tidbits there of what Dave Haney thinks the Amiga could have become or should have become. Let's go to our Dave. Ah, deep breath. Was there anything in that article, Dave, that you think could have saved Commodore? Or would Commodore's management have found a way to sink the company regardless? What I see now does not come from any um, source of malice. Uh, I'm not I'm not trying to hurt anyone's feelings, but no, I, I really don't believe so. I, I think it's uh, no, the, the Amiga couldn't survive. Um, if they didn't die in 94, it would be 93 or 95. Commodore were incompetent from the mid-90s onwards, the really mid-80s onwards. They were also, by the 90s, they were far too small a company to compete, and they had the same fate as all the other micro companies had, Atari, Amstrad, all the rest of it. They, they weren't in a position to throw the money that was needed to do it. But the story is interesting because it's written by Dave Haney, Um like Neil said, he he's, he he was right there. Um, however, I don't think there's any way the Amiga was credible beyond 1994. The only way it would work would be like the same story as Amstrad and Atari if they had come out with a stronger product, cheaper, earlier, and more importantly, if they'd funded development of software and helped development do it. Neil? You kind of came around back around to what I was thinking there. You you were saying there's no way Commodore could compete in 94, but I was going to ask, are you coming at this from a position of what they had, or are you thinking more about what Dave Haney said they should have had? Could they have competed with so, what they should have had? I'll come on to, I'll come on to that okay. as well in my comment, but yeah. So Commodore were failing badly to do that back in 1985. Look at Neil's fantastic series on the Amiga 1000 um, to show how... Um, Commodore didn't even launch that one properly um, with support from developers getting the software lined up, um, throwing money at it if need be. 
Um, and I'm always baffled at Amiga fans who think there was just like one simple sliding door event that would have separated Commodore from success and failure. I think they had failure written so many times from 1985 onwards. And if you look at any successful launches from any time in the mid 80s onwards, you needed massive investments. And all Commodore could manage to do was squeak out the product out of the door, a shadow of what they originally intended, cost reduced, late and expensive. But Commodore weren't short of money in the 80s. They they were riding this wave of Commodore 64 cash. So the money was there if they wanted to throw it at it. But... Do you think they in the 80s, not I'm not, I, I don't know about in the 80s. Sure. Uh, in 1985, when they launched the Amiga, there's talk about cost cuts and, and, and laying people off back then. I, I don't know. I, I just don't know what the financial position was. Sure. You might be right. Yeah, I don't know. But certainly by the, the mid 90s, I don't think they had the financial might of Sony or Microsoft to do things. And that's what it took. I mean, it took Sony and Microsoft to really, um, when they launched their, their, their platforms, they put tons and tons of money into it they they made it they, they were making a loss making console that that had to to catch up even look at the 3do for example it had loads of different backers but even it didn't have enough backing to put to, to throw the money up the wall so much for the thing to finally catch on and become profitable and i i just don't think commodore were in, were in any position uh, to, to, to spend that kind of money to to create the platform's success they needed. Um, but the truth is I would want them to survive. Uh, Amiga has character. It's a great system. It's important for what it did in the industry and also for people's memories. So um, setting the reality of things aside, yes, I'd want them to live on, but with no disrespect intended to, to Dave Haney, and I do appreciate he spends lots of time talking to the community, but I don't think anything of what they're proposing in, the, in this article was anything like as groundbreaking as the original Amiga. So what they're proposing there was, for me, a, a kind of playing catch up to the PC, possibly a little bit before the PC did it, but playing catch up to the PC. So I think the only way the Amiga credibly survives would it be if it did what Windows 95 did before Microsoft managed Windows 95, if it became a powerful desktop, multitasking environment beyond what the original Amiga operating system was before Microsoft did it. Um, but just to try and get some of the Amiga fans back on side with me, I like the Amiga for what it was, but for the most part, I only liked the PC for what it did. I think the Amiga had uh, more charm and character than the PC did. Although in recent years, I've become very fond of DOS. I, I can't really tell you why. Neil, tear me well, apart. Well, no, I don't need to tear you apart because I can see the comments now tearing your comparison of Windows to Workbench apart and just how far ahead of the game that you know the Amiga was with its preempting preemptive multitasking operating system back in 1985. But let's get some views from Chris. Chris, the uh, the Amiga is the Alfa Romeo of the retro computing world. Discuss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I don't, no, I think Dave's actually raised some some valid points, but I think we're missing. You know, what we're really talking about here is what if the management culture wasn't the way it was? You know, how would things have panned out? And if they're talking about back in, you know, what was it, 1991 or 1992, already thinking about a dedicated GPU? I mean, that's pretty cool stuff. Um, so, yeah. But what I've often thought about is because I think, you know, there's, there's always a possibility of an alternate timeline and and there was a very special place for the Amiga. So, Everybody knows I'm not a fan of Apple at all, but would an alternate reality have Amiga in place of Mac? Because I see a lot of similarities. I can't help um, but see those in both the system design approach and also the user culture, which is key. Um, so, you know, you've got a graphical user interface driven operating system versus CLI, you know, as in DOS. Um, when I jumped to PC, it was quite a culture shock that I had to actually type in commands to get anything to work. Hmm. It's interesting because the Apple roadmap took them down the Power PC processor route and then into ARM, but in the meantime, they'd fully adopted ARM for their iPhones. So mm. if Commodore had progressed with the Ombre chipset, had got comfortable with the, the RISC or ARM processor that, that they had in there, um, I think it was a Hewlett Packard RISC mm. CPU that they were working with. Um, if they'd got comfortable with that and and the the lovely low power design of the risk processors could they have then evolved that into um portable devices mobile phones could, could the iphone have been a you know it, would that have An been a phone yeah 
<laughs> Who knows? Um, but also, you know, the similar in, ter- in terms of the user base, the, the Amiga was used mostly as a professional workstation. I'm talking about now more for the creativity side of things. So, video and graphic design, as we all know, that's the space Apple moved into. Um, they had uh, Apple also had very specific hardware. So, whilst obviously uh, uh, Macs are customizable, generally it's it's not as infinite as as a pc um can be and that results in it's easier to make a lean operating system and also develop games if you know what the 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 end user has got in the box much easier than developing for an uh, almost infinite um, range of peripherals and add-ons and and cards you know sound and graphics that you do in the pc so therefore you can smooth your coding out um and you know having the the sound and the graphics not just integrated but actually very capable you know the amiga had that again once you jump to pc oh you might actually need an extra graphics card or you definitely need a sound card unless you're happy with farts and beeps um and this is really key though a cult like following let's face it the amiga had it and that's what's gone on to help Apple make a success, you know, even in the years where they weren't really at the forefront of everybody's minds, if you walked into a business that had a design studio or had a print studio or getting into multimedia, they had Macs and you could not move those designers away from their Macs, even though all the softwares, all the software was available for PCs. It was just this cult like following, which continued all the way on you know, until, you know, Steve Dot Jobs, bless him, passed away. Um, I'd, I'd say it's wavering a little bit, but there's still a lot of fanboys out there. Dave? I just want to make it clear that Chris was the one that said cult-like following, not me. <laughs> I didn't say cult. I wouldn't say cult. And I don't think about Amiga's, Amiga fans in that way. Um, he does. I, I love him. <laughs> Did um, Commodore need that personality? You know, Apple had Woz and Jobs. Uh, I, PCs, I guess, had Bill Gates spearheading that side of things. Did the Amiga need a personality? And Barmer. Don't forget Steve Barmer. Steve Barmer, yes, doing his monkey dances yeah, at the launch of uh, <laughs> when a very sweaty Steve Barmer. And the cast of Friends. And the cast of I mean, yeah, um, it was two of them made oh, that's the, the right. VHS about how to use Windows, wasn't it? <laughs> that's so um, bad, so but, so. But I mean, you you would struggle to be less cool than a sweaty Steve Barmer, so it wouldn't have taken much for Commodore to have had a person. <laughs> I could manage it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's true. Um, now, it's true. Alex, let's come to you. I know you're not really a huge Amiga fan because you were more of an arcade and a console gamer back in the day, so. Speak honestly. You don't need to worry about offending anyone here. Dave's done plenty of that already. What did you make of the Amiga back in the day compared to what you were enjoying? Did you have access to one? Did well, you know anyone who had one? I wasn't a fan. I was travelling at that time. I was living in Sweden and literally got out of the whole gaming, computing experience altogether. You know, I was following my <laughs> music career. <laughs> but uh, that never come to anything. Yeah, so I don't have much of an opinion on it. I mean, all I can see is that what were they aiming the, the console or the computer at? Was it at gamers or developers? Because there were so many other game consoles on the market at that time. You know. Yeah. Um, well, well, when it came out, when the 1000 came out, this was part of the problem. Commodore didn't really know what they had on their hands. They didn't really know how to market it or who to aim it at. Exactly. And it, was over, it, was, it was only over time that the 500 kind of evolved into, in Europe, very much a games machine. Whereas yeah. if you speak to someone in the US, for example, they'll very much say it was a big box productivity type machine. Um, but I, yes. I think Sweden, I think the Swedes liked their Amigas. Did you not see any over Probably. there? Probably, yeah. I mean... Yeah. I mean, for people like me who grew up in the 80s with the 8-bit computers, the Spectrums, the BBCs, and then moving into the 90s with console games, the 16-bit era, where you had arcade perfect games on those systems. Um, is this moving into the 3D era now? I don't know, is it 92, 93? Uh, it's not was, quite, is it? It was 3D, but um, yeah. it's, not, it's not hardware accelerated 3D, so I, not I, quite at the PlayStation era yet. Yeah, if they were trying to attract people like me in, I, I don't think they did a, a, a good job because they weren't doing anything different at all. And we'd Just already played briefly, all those games. Tell us briefly, Alex, because I've not heard this side of, uh, of you. Tell us briefly about your music career. What, what, where were you going? What were you doing? Uh, well, I was in a band. So I was playing bass in a band in London, in Dartford. And that was just like a covers band. And then I met a, a, a Swedish girl and I moved out to Sweden. It's always a lady. Lived in, Stock, lived in Stock, <laughs> Stockholm for about six years. 
and did a little show on the radio as well as on Bandit Radio, the rock home of Stockholm, giving you classic yeah. rock tracks and the best nice. music. <laughs> did you have a radio voice or did, did you use your normal that voice? That was it. it up? That was it. <laughs> did, you okay. have a like? did you have a <laughs> see, I could, classic I could, rock all night? <laughs> that's it. I could get away with it over there, you see. Yeah. I couldn't yeah, get away with it over here. Exactly. Yeah, I <laughs> know yeah, it was all fun. I was just finding my feet in another country. Didn't really know what I was doing, but I enjoyed traveling, enjoyed meeting people and just if it wasn't doing building, I was happy, you know. Yeah. Um, but I didn't play much games through the sort of mid to late nineties at all. So okay. I didn't come back into game until I don't know, when did the PlayStation come out? Late that was 90. 94 Japan, 95 US. Yeah, I think it was around about 98 I got a PlayStation. Right. Saw, the, yeah. saw Tomb Raider running and there was 3D corridors. Oh, that was amazing. Blew me away. Got back into Excellent. gaming then. Good, good, good. Well, just coming back to our Amiga story then, I mean, the question really that... that should be asked about this whole article is was there anything that could have actually taken on the might of the ibm pc compatibles um yes we had apple's offerings as chris alluded to we saw acorn certainly over here acorn risk-based archimedes machines which were absolutely crushed by intel's marketing department as much as i loved them and would have liked to have seen them successful um although arm did have the last laugh in the end and continues to do so against intel um we saw atari fall by the wayside and dave i would love to hear or see another article like this from an atari engineer's perspective uh if any listeners have any links to such a thing please do post it dave I would imagine that the Atari story would be similar. They launched the Falcon, the TT, and they launched the Jaguar, and they they didn't have the resources to to back them, and they had to pull products from the market, which is catastrophic, I imagine, for them, and that's why Atari failed as well. I, I'm going to say that the Atari story and the Commodore story would be really similar. Um, to the point where if you look at the specs of the Falcon, that does have a DSP in it. You know, yeah, the, the Falcon sounds like the described. one of the ones you mentioned. So, you know, maybe there's a very similar piece of hardware there to what the A3000 Plus, was it called, um, was going to be, as described by Dave Haney. But, of course, what software is there for it, you know? The, the, it, it, it kind of has SD compat backwards compatibility, doesn't it, Dave? But it's not fully. Um, yeah, yeah. Games can be made to work on the. If they don't work already, they can be made to work. So a Falcon can or a TT can be a great way of playing ST games, but it's not a great deal. They do they they do the existing ST software faster. So if you're using it for DT desktop publishing, or if you're using it for uh, music, then it was a nicer way to do it. That's why you had the the high end Falcons that were done. Uh, was it C C Media or C Labs or something did the. The, the, the aftermarket falcons oh um, the nice black colored ones yeah very niche yeah. very very niche yeah so i mean and that that would be a similar story the a3000 plus was aiming at 1991 uh, and if the falcon had appeared in 1991 that too would have been a powerhouse well ahead of the game and timing of course is everything in technology um so yeah i mean i i guess at best maybe we would have seen the ombre and the likes of the cd32 might have got some actual 3d processing power but like the Falcon, would it then have found the support of game dev studios to make the likes of Ridge Racer, you know, the, the killer apps that it would have needed to be an international success? I don't know. I don't know. Um, the Big Box Amiga could have continued to service the creative types, a low-cost version for the home users, but even with one more generation of Amigas, I think Dave is probably right. It would have suffered the same fate, but maybe it would have lived on in the form of an expansion card to service PCs, or maybe they would have moved into the mobile market. We will... We will never know if Commodore could have been a 3DFX alternative. Um, Dave? I think that's the, that's the only credible route. And I didn't want to mention it because I know it's you've mentioned it to me in the past. I didn't want to steal your thunder. But an expansion card, put, taking a, an Amiga card and putting it into a 386, a 486, a Pentium, and having the, the strength of the Amiga's custom chips, because that is what the Amiga did. If you look back to 1985, 68,000 was a powerful chip back then, but the Amiga 
uh, the strength of the Amiga wasn't in the 68,000. It wasn't in the, the supporting cast, Denise, Paula, and all the rest of it, and Agnes, and Wilbur, and Bartholomew, and all the rest of them. Um, that was <laughs> the strength of it. So put, yeah, put, <laughs> putting those onto an expansion card to put in your PC, like the 3D FX, like an Amiga card, and maybe, maybe, maybe people might have bought an Amiga card to play better games on their PCs, and they might have bought a, an upgraded Amiga Amiga card to do all the creative stuff. Maybe, maybe, there I don't know. The Creative Labs Amiga Blaster, cards that never were. <laughs> we'll never know. But thanks to Dave <laughs> Haney's article, we can at least have a much better insight into what could have been. When I first got back into the Amiga... Yay, another Amiga story. Dave's <laughs> going to love this. Well, actually, Dave should love this because it's not really an Amiga story. It's really a PC story, but uh, let's get into it. It's an it. upgrade. It's an Amiga yeah. upgrade story. <laughs> Yeah, the ultimate yeah. Amiga upgrade story. Maybe have we spoiled the ending? Maybe let's get let's get into it. <laughs> but anyway, when I first got back into the Amiga and other micros from my past, I instantly had this strange need for a return to a forgotten form factor, the wedge. And I actually hatched a plan, which was to fit a gaming PC into, uh, as in a modern gaming PC, into an Amiga 500 case. And I actually have the current state of my project four years in now. I have it right here. So let's take a look. So what I've got is I've got an A500 case and I've got a mostly working keyboard. The only thing that doesn't work is the control key, which is a real pain if you want to ever reboot an Amiga without switching it off and on again. Um, and that's it. I actually <laughs> haven't got any further. What, you've got a Good. keyboard in a case? Is I've, that got, a, I've got a donor case. I've got a donor case. And that's as far as I've got. You know, I truly is the before, Alfa Romeo of computing. It is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Alfa Romeo has always turned into project cars as well. Yeah, it's, it's a back burner project, that's for sure. So I haven't given up on it. Um, but uh, basically, um, there, there's a, a project that's been shared on, on the subreddit uh, and actually, this project was created by another Reddit user called 3D Print RC, and he's done exactly what I wanted to. Only he's done it much better than I ever would, in a machine nicknamed the A5600. He's basically recreated an Amiga 500 case as a 3D printable version, so it's not an original case. There's no butchering of an original machine here. So, a 3D printable A500 case. Stop it, Dave. But he's made some specific changes, which are very important. So he's basically done it so that it fits an ITX um, uh, uh, mechanical PC keyboard and um, also so it can fit an ITX motherboard in it. So on the keyboard, he's used the colorings of the Amiga key, keycaps uh, with some subtle alterations. But basically, when you glance at this, it looks like an Amiga 500 but it isn't, okay? It's a fully working modern PC, so some specs for you. It's actually got a working floppy disk drive um, in the original location, and then it's got an optical disk drive, which is neatly tucked underneath the floppy disk drive but kind of staggered towards the front. He's got an AS Rock Vitality B450 Gaming ITX AC motherboard. He's got a Ryzen 5 5600G G, uh, CPU. He's got 32 gig of 3600 DDR4 RAM. It's got a one terabyte M.2 drive and an arrogant Quake mechanical keyboard. All arrogant. of this. Yeah. <laughs> an arrogant Quake mechanical keyboard. Is that what I it's called? Know. I don't know why it's arrogant. That's what was okay. in the write up. So I'm going with it. Um, but all of this is shoved into the A500 shape wedge case. Uh, you'd be forgiven for thinking he'd settle for the integrated GPU. Uh, that's probably what I would have ended up doing. Um, in fact, my idea was just to butcher a laptop because that's the only motherboard I could think would, would actually fit inside this space. But no, he's actually got a gigabyte GTX 1070 ITX graphics card squeezed in there as well. This thing is absolutely mental. It's more powerful than the tower under my desk. And it looks like an Amiga 500. Um, it's about the same size. Neil, would you have thought this is possible? Well, it's about the same size because it is an Amiga 500. It's in the A500 case. Well, no, um, it's a 3D printed case. It's not an original oh, A500 case. Oh, I thought it was an original so, case. No, so he's he's made the changes so you can fit in a mechanical PC keyboard in there rather ah, than... Um, clever. And, and so that you've got the mountings for the ITX motherboard. So very distinct differences, but at a glance, this thing looks like an A500. Right. I get yeah. you. I get you. Well, the Ombre chipset has arrived. Here it is. 
Um, yeah, I'm not surprised somebody's done this because Alex has actually seen my mini gauntlet cabinet. We've had it down in the arcade next to the full size gauntlet cabinet. And in there is a mini ITX case. Now, this thing is 10 or 12 years old, but even back then it had an onboard GeForce GPU. Uh, it ran pretty hot, so I had to put a big cooling fan in the back of the cabinet to keep it cool. But uh, combine the mini ITX board with a Pico PSU, and you've got quite a slim build. So you could. Um, I think you could get that easily into an A500 case. You have the problem you've been tackling with for four years, Chris, interfacing a keyboard. But there are interfaces for classic keyboards. Um, you know, I've seen everything from an Electron to a ZX Spectrum, BBC Micro, go into what this interface. I can't remember the name of it right now, but there is an interface through which Kira? you can... Uh, Kira rings a bell. I think it might be the Kira. Yeah. So, um Shira. Master you of the universe. Could have saved yourself four <laughs> years' work there, Chris, if you just got a key raw. Um, <laughs> so if you combine that with a mini ITX board, yes, but I'd still be worried about heat. So how is this thing handling the heat? Yeah, from what I can tell, looking at the pictures, it's just got a, a bank of fans sticking out the bottom. Um, so similar to how you disperse uh, heat from a, a laptop, I guess. Yeah. Okay, sure. So you can use it on your duvet and fill it with fluff. <laughs> don't, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Alex, I know you know, you're yes. into arcades and, and consoles, um, and what I'm reminded of is how things like the original Xbox, for example, were essentially PCs thrown into a console case, uh, and until modders got hold of them, they were basically you know throttled so that you couldn't use them as a replacement PC. So are there any consoles from your past that you'd happily have used as a desktop replacement if it had allowed you to? Um, well, my favourite console is the Super Nintendo. Um, but I don't think Nintendo had any plans to make that into a, a personal computer. I know they did with the Famicom. They had a the Famicom computer in a Japan, wasn't it? But it wasn't brought to Europe or America because it had a keyboard, yeah. didn't it? Yeah, a um, keyboard, and they had a basic programming language, so you could yeah. learn to program Why they with didn't it. bring that to the NES in Europe, I don't know. Because I think that would have been quite cool to have seen that. You had a mouse for your Super Nintendo. Yeah, that's true. In a paint mouse. package, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah, there was a similar setup for the Master game. System as well that uh, I saw recently at, um, at one of the Perth Mega Users Group that were an add-on keyboard for. It wasn't actually the Master System, but it was a Sega Master System chipset, and you had an external yeah. keyboard and everything. You could essentially use it as a micro. But, but yeah, uh, just did... ju just generally, oh. Alex, would it have ruined the experience for you if you could have done your homework on your games console? Well, <laughs> I didn't do much homework on my on my Spectrum. I mean, going back, it was the BBC Micro we had at school, but at home, the yeah. Spectrum I used was just gaming. It was just gaming yeah. for me. And then when I left school, I got into building. I didn't really have any use for a computer, you know. So mm. all through the 90s, I didn't own a computer. So, <laughs> you know, it was just, for me, it was just gaming, all, ga all about gaming really and what the best console what the most powerful console could bring into your home what games that you could bring to the home and it was bringing in arcade games then i'd buy it you know yeah when did you buy your first arcade cabinet out of interest um that would have been around 2009 i think i bought a space invaders on ebay space 300 quid wow it was so it's loud that's cheap. we couldn't work out how to turn the volume down i think the pot had broken off so me and Vic put a, literally put a sock in it, <laughs> in the speaker, <laughs> just to dumb it down. <laughs> it was so nice. loud. <laughs> and I didn't have room for it either. I didn't know where I was going to put it. It ended up at my friend's house in his garage. And there it just sat. I went around there once a week and just admired it. <laughs> I love the sound. The, the arcade machines have to be too loud, though. If their normal oh. volume is not good enough, it has to be loud. Oh, That's definitely. True. That's what a lot of people have said. The atmosphere in the, in the museum, yeah. you've got it spot on. I mean, you have to tweak some games because some are louder than others. Um, yeah. But it, but I always think Space Invaders should be king in the arcade. You should always hear that over everything else, you know, because that's how it my was favorite. back in the day. Yeah. My, my favourite yeah. is the Gauntlet 2 music. Oh. That that little that little ditty you get, that's brilliant. Yeah, when you walk in the museum and you just hear that kind of little intro, it gives it a real, ch like a church, you're in a church feeling, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, there you yeah. go, Chris, does that answer your question Berserk. about desktop? You've got a Berserk as well, you? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you got a Berserk, haven't you? Yeah, I've got a Berserk. Oh, he's detected in pocket. Yeah, I love Berserk, yeah. 
Absolute classic nice, game. Nice. Sorry, I, I should be talking about Amigas, not arcade games. Sorry, I've no, added, I've... <laughs> well, Dave, Dave, let's 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 go on to you. I mean, I know how much you love the Amiga, and let's face it, this is this is a PC which you're into. And if you paint this a really depressing grey, it would look like an Atari ST. Oh, um, yeah, so, what are your thoughts for an Amiga on a rainy day? <laughs> <laughs> this is the best thing to do to an Amiga. Rip the guts out, oh, throw them in the e-waste, <laughs> and put something better instead. And you on top of that, well. you can then run Win UAE to play all the Amiga classics that you couldn't play in the ST or DOS, like Agony. That's true. And I'm sure there's other ones. Oh. Um, I, I don't mean a word of that. I don't mean anything about that at all. I'm just joking. I'm just pushing buttons. Um, I think it's a good project. I, I like that they haven't used uh, a, a, a real Amiga case. They've 3D printed it. Um, and I did start to wonder about heat issues, but then I started to think about how modern PCs are these days. Modern PCs these these days, efficient, they have increased efficiency, but in order to get more performance, they've they've gone far beyond the sweet spot in efficiency. And modern graphics cards, the high end ones at least, high end graphics cards and uh, CPUs are operating using far too much electricity, far too many watts of, of power, and you end up, yes, you get the you get the power from it, but you don't end up getting um you don't end up getting uh, value for power, if you know what I mean. So if you've got something that's energy efficient, then you can put it into this and you can have a fairly powerful thing. Neil is holding up a box, and in that is uh, how many watts? This is a 1,000-watt PSU. Oh, for goodness sake. Because um, I've got a 3080 GPU to go in my machine, but the 650-watt PSU is probably not quite enough for it. Not so enough. I've gone yeah. for this is a gigabyte 1000 watt PSU just because of that GPU. So just tallies up with exactly what you're saying, Dave. Yeah. If you get, I mean, the, the GTX 650 Ti off the top of my head and the 1650, those are those are ones at the sweet spot. I'm not sure what the, the sweet spot is for CPUs. I'm not that I'm not that up to date on current things. But if you get the right ones, you get a really energy efficient and powerful thing. It's not quite the performance of the top end ones, but that would be ideal in a small form factor case like this. So yeah, yeah. Um, don't kill any Amigas. No, I hate to say it, chaps, but we're up to nearly an hour, and you know, so so the whole long episode last week was nothing to do with me <laughs> being away. <laughs> let's push on. It's true, yeah. right? Let's let's push on. Can it play Doom? In fact, I'll quickly summarise the closing of this story. Then um, it can play Doom. Uh, I may I, I touch base with uh, 3D Print RC. He's kind of provided us photos, uh, but do check out on the subreddit for the links if you're a listener, so you can see those. But he's also linked us to a video of it playing um, Doom Eternal. I haven't even played that on my PC because it's not up to it. And he's playing this in an A500 case, essentially. So it is really great stuff. Do check it out. On to my story. OMG USB BBC ATX RGB. Submitted by um, actually two people. Um, C3R7X Serlix, not sure, and Raiden of Awesome. And in the interest of balance, my story this week is the polar opposite of what Chris has talked about. And I know that at least some of us are fans of BBC, and I don't mean what you're thinking. It's not the TV channel. It's the BBC Micro, a British microcomputer that was in most of our schools and was vital in a catch-up revolution of computing in the UK in the 80s. The story of the BBC has been told many times. I'd recommend Neil's videos on it, um, but there's loads of places you can find out about the BBC and the Literacy Project. So I'll, I'll just go into a little taster of it here. So the literary pro Literacy Project was to try and get the UK up to speed, which was what was correctly predicted to be a revolution in how we do things in the workplace, thanks to microcomputers. Um, I don't think Neil would be doing RMC if we didn't have it in the UK, nor would I be doing this. I'm not sure about Chris, but yeah, um, because he obviously he was not in Australia at that point, but Australians, I don't know if they had the same thing. But when I look back at the archives, it's the kind of footage, the style, the presenters and the content that I really enjoy. And I hope we have a little bit of that in the podcast. We've talked about shows like Games Master and so on and Bad Influence and so on. And while I think there's a place for them, my preference is for the BBC style here, Tomorrow's World, 
and in modern days, Tom Scott and Neil, and of course the BBC Literacy programmes. So you can put your Dave Perry and your Andy Crane in the bin. Give me <laughs> Ian McNaught Davis and Judith Han. Thank you. Now, the computer they commissioned, and there's some great documentaries and dramas in the process, was a rugged, expandable micro with a solid operating system, the BBC Micro. It was the first micro that was ever in my house because my mum borrowed one from the school over the summer. And I playing Elite on that is, is such a wonderful memory. Elite and BBC Micro, it's incredible. Um, submitted to the subreddit by, uh, I know it's Razor of Awesome, but actually um, C37, C3, C3R7X uh, had submitted it the week before. Um, is a story about someone who's taken um, a, a BBC and turned it into um, a BBC in a, in a modern housing. Now, it's actually got a lot of appeal to it from what initially I thought was quite daft. And I'll say now that it's not destructive and it is real hardware. It's just not. It's not just a system and a chip. It's a real BBC there. Now, Neil, what do you think about putting real hardware in new cases as opposed to what we were talking about, which is putting new hardware in old cases? Um, well, um, this particular example, and hopefully Duncan has has put a picture up on on the screen, and you'll be able to describe it um, shortly. But uh, my opinion on this example that you've given us is that it's a work of art. I mean. Putting a new PC in an Amiga 500 case is is all fun, and you create this what I guess you'd call a sleeper system. But this is more like framing old hardware and hanging it in an art gallery. It's it's a really beautiful build. The the beeps board is visible. It's beautiful, beautifully lit up, um, and it's just a celebration of 40 year old hardware that you can actually safely use. And um, <clears throat> I guess there are plenty of examples of real hardware with smashed up cases. Uh, beyond saving um, or even just the boards themselves for sale that you can fix up if they're not working and why not put it in a in a case where you can actually use it if you don't have the original case or if you don't have access or just don't want to do a, a 3d printed alternative i think it's great so i'm all for it dave i should probably not ignore that the idea of a bbc being emulated on an ARM-based an ARM systems like so many emulators are, has a very strange symmetry to it because the BBC Micro was the start of a long journey to what we now have in their smartphones and all the rest of it and in these system and chip things. Now, the project itself that we're talking about today hinges on one happy coincidence. The BBC Micro motherboard happens to be very nearly an ATX form factor, which is a standard PC motherboard. And that means that you can mount it in a normal PC case. And that's just what Alan, who goes by Deku Newcomb, has done. Um, he's put it into this really nice white mid-tower case with a window on it so you can see it inside it. And he's also used two other projects that he's done. Now, the first is um, ATX4VC. And that was actually submitted as a story to the subreddit after I'd, picked, after I'd picked this story. So thanks to someone with a fantastic username, Remington Noiseless. Um, so I'll do a little bit of diversion into that story now. It's a small PCB that connects a 24-pin ATX power connector. So that's your standard main power supply from a PC power, power supply, which Neil's going to lift up again, I'm I sure. I am, I'm um, just checking. <laughs> yes, yes, it's compatible. I can put 1,000 watts into my BBC Micro. Yes. <laughs> Elite will run faster as a result. Um, it also has PWN fa fan headers, so that's four-pin fan headers with a temperature probe support, USB-C power out, and addressable RGB headers. So he's managed to get all that running in the case. Um, and you can use, it means you can use a standard, PC ATX power supply. But what's cool is you can also use a Pico PSU. A Pico PSU is one that takes a 12, usually takes 12 volts through a barrel jack and then produces the different voltages you need in a PC. So by using a Pico PCU, Pico PSU with this, you can get a little power supply that will power most things. And perhaps it's a better option than what people tend to use, which is the Meanwell Industrial PSU Neil. Well, the nice thing with the Pico PSU is you're putting the brick outside the case. So you have yes. the Pico inside, but then you have something like maybe a Meanwell 
FPS you outside that's going into the Pico. So you take that heat and you take a lot of that outside of the case, yeah. which is a nice yeah. option. So yeah. yeah, you can have the power brick of the wall. You could put it inside if you wanted to as well. Um, but it also has it also has power switch support as well. So it's better than the mean wheel option. It has a lot of the things you would want to have if you use this inside an Amiga or a big box Atari or something like that. Um, but going back to the original submission, he's called this project the BBC project, the RGB, and inside the case is the BBC motherboard to full height. And what you might actually be thinking of full height is actually half height. Full height is bigger, five and a quarter inch drives, great big tall things. RGB backlighting, and another one of his projects, one that I actually did back in Kickstarter, which is USB 4VC, which allows you to connect modern USB devices to all computers using his board and a Pi. So an Apple or a, a PC was what he did the Kickstarter on, but obviously he's used it with the BBC here. And it means that he's got the BBC board and he's replaced the power supply and the keyboard and he's got it working that way. Now, it means that if you get a nail touch in this, it means if you get a battered old BBC that's been in a school that's got grubby, it's broken, the keyboard maybe doesn't work, the power supply needs replaced, you can take the the main board from it and even if it's broken you can likely repair the main board and get it in this project so i do like it as much as i have nostalgia for a wedge form factor i actually prefer a separate keyboard and pizza box style like a, a mega st or comma or 128d Neil. Do you remember on the BBC Micro, there was the little expansion module to the left of the keyboard and um, kids oh. always put their thumb in it and pushed it through. So you had a hole oh. to the left. Is there anywhere on this case? Fingers. Is there anywhere on this case where you can just sort of push a bit of the case through just for authenticity? That's maybe an option. Maybe a, maybe a, a destructible bit for kids. Oh, I'd like to break their little fingers for that. When you see, you see one, it's been done to it. Uh, the, the, there was a patch on it you could break out to put a, to put in a, a ROM in, I think. Yeah, that's right. And kids just pushed, oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> so once I got past my initial shock at this, it's a great project. I like it. Um, although I don't think anything will hit the nostalgia spot quite like a BBC Master with two drives, and a microvitec cub monitor, all in that matching cream-painted metal in some kind of stand that houses all the bits tightly together. Nothing will match that. Now, Alex, I'm pretty sure there's no room for arcade boards in non-arcade cabinets in your archive. You want the full authentic thing, guts inside and the full proper casing. But thinking about the second project, the board that would allow you to use a standard ATX power supply in the arcade cabinet and give you nice little screw terminals to connect your 5, minus 5, 12, minus 12, whatever, minus 3.3, whatever, plus the ability to add lighting and fans. Do you ever add fans? Do you ever add yes. fans inside the, the arcade cabs? Yeah, some you boards. Because I'm thinking maybe. for longevity because you've got these chips and they want them to last forever. Yeah, Astro Blaster that's in Neil's cave, it's in a cage and there's five board sets inside there. And that actually came, I think it was one of the first machines with a, with a fan built in um, just to keep the thing cool because it does run really hot. Um, yeah, I'm not, I, I don't mind fans. I'm not a fan of anything else really, not lighting and all that kind of stuff. People take original boards and put them in scratch built arcade machines and then they then they try and track down all the original artwork the the marquee the control panel which i'm not a fan of because there's always arcade collectors out there that are looking for all the original stuff for their original machine and they've just taken that and put it on a scratch build well if you've gone that far with the cabinet and put that much work into it get the repro art you know get a reproduction marquee control panel well, they're not using repro art now that's daft yeah, yeah, they they're hunting Duffed. down the original stuff to put in their scratch build cabinet, which I'm I'm not a fan of. You know, no, I, I'm all for about nostalgia, originality for me. That's that's what it's about because these are social. They've come out of a social environment, uh, a history of being in an arcade where you know they were they were made for people to enjoy, and all the little things like all the patina that people try and get rid of, I quite like. Because it's come out of that environment, 
you might have things inscribed on the top of the cabinet. I'm not going to say what we found. Nah, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was hilarious. I'll, I'll wasn't repeat it, it for you. I'll repeat it. So if you climb up, Discs of Tron is a very tall cabinet in the arcade archive. But if you climb up and look on it, scratched into the top is a word beginning with F and then the army. So it says F the army, yeah, someone scratched yeah. into the top. So we don't know where this was before, if it was on a Navy base or something. Probably a lot of these cabinets came out of um, army bases and stuff like that to entertain the troops. Um, and, you know, even just having the cigarette burns on top of gunfight. Have you seen that, Neil? There's a whole line of cigarette burns. So they had a smoke, stuck it on top, carried on playing. And I just find that yeah. part of the history as long as the cool. artwork's still intact, there's a bit of, you know, you don't want the control panel all rusty and falling apart. You, then you've got to replace things. But a little bit of that social history is important, especially for a museum. Um, just on the topic of power supplies, I know that you've mentioned in the past you've had problems with certain games when you've switched from the old original power supply to a more modern switching power supply. What, what sort of issues does that cause? Uh, Robotron resets the score every now and again and that's intermittent can happen anytime you know and that is there is a there is a mod you can get for that if you switch your old power supply to a switching one there's a mod to to sort that problem out but then it's just another thing to get if you can just keep these original board sets going the, the original power supply should be fine and go on forever right Right. Um, that's the the old that'll be linear power supplies great yeah big exactly honking transformers yeah um i mean there are certain games that are just notoriously difficult to keep working um berserk is one um and what was the other one we've got uh tempest tempest is another difficult one that's got a, a vector color monitoring which you know is, uh, it's, it's, is it is it Burger Time that's got a slightly temperamental PSU um, discs of Tron PSU needs to go in that? Yeah, I go into the arcade archive. I went in the other day and there was just this great big PSU sat in the middle of the floor, looking a bit rusty. And I'm like, oh, is that going in the bin? No, 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 that's fine. Don't worry about the rust. <laughs> it's got handles, isn't <laughs> okay. it? It's so heavy. Yeah, it's actually got metal <laughs> handles for you to lift it up. It's yeah. huge. Caps but of course, this all goes through. Uh, this all goes through Richard. He is the authority yeah. on on the electronics. So if he says it's okay, it's okay. There are certain things you have to replace. You can't rely on some of the older stuff because it wasn't that. It wasn't well built in the first place. You know. Yeah. And I'm keeping yeah. it going now. Um, yeah. No one had any intention of building these to last ten years. Never mind thirty or forty. Yeah. Exactly. So. Yeah, for me, it's all yeah. about originality, nostalgia, and just trying mm -hmm. to preserve as much as we can, especially for the museum, yeah. you know. Yeah. Now, sadly, while there are some great games in the BBC, the library isn't huge. So while the C64, Specky, and Amstrad were roaring ahead in popularity, probably thanks to that computer literacy project, the BBC was simply too expensive for home users, and the home based version, the Electron, which... Um, uh, Chris is a fan of, um, was cost reduced as much as possible, which meant breaking compatibility BBC games, and it didn't quite catch hold. But the BBC has some fantastic games, Chucky Egg, Repton, Exile, Planetoid, Castle Quest, and for a short period in the mid-80s, in the early to mid-80s, it was the top machine in the UK, and this project is a great way of giving yourself a BBC for if you are if you like to tinker with your BBC, this would be much better than a, a, a battered old wedge. So give the project a look. Duncan will have the, the, the link to it in the show notes. Um, it's listed in the order he's done it. So it's a, it tells a story, not just, not just pictures of it. It tells a story of how he's developed it and the problems he had. Time now for our community question of the week. And last week's question was all about collecting. And the question was, what stage of collecting are you at? Do you flip to fund the items you want? Do you use the machines or do you just fix them and shelve them? What drives the hobby for you? So um, I'll go in with the first answer, which comes from Mogway. It's quite a long answer, so I'm just going to compact it a little bit to give everyone else a, a fair listen as well. Um, so Mogway starts off by saying that... Um, in, in in lockdown, that's when they converted to the hobby of collecting. So a fairly new collector started by watching YouTube videos from popular YouTubers, um, and then they just got into tinkering. Their, their main motivation was to collect 
the systems from their childhood. And I think that's quite a common starting point for a lot of us. Let's rebuy the things that we had as kids that, that invoke all of that nostalgia. So they're talking ZX Spectrum, BBC Micro, Sega Master System, NES, uh, SNES, old PCs, etc. And then um, they go on to talk about um, th their budget. So they say, I keep a very tight budget on my hobby as I have very limited spare funds and space in my small flat. I'm keen on the tinkering aspect though. Uh, and so they're working on a project for a cheap replacement for the Acorn Electron ULA. So this is a, a part that often goes pop. Um, and uh, when it does, well, you, you can't replace it. So they're working on reverse engineering the ULA to, to make a replacement. And they say that the ULA project really encapsulates what they get, what they want to get out of the hobby, trying to make a cherished old machine from my childhood work again, play it whilst at the same time learning loads about how it ticks, FPGAs, PCB design and SMD soldering. Nice. They, they, they end that, that sentence with nice. nice. Um, and I think that's really important because we think about this hobby as looking backwards, as being nostalgic and retro, but actually there's so much new stuff you can learn through doing it, whether that's soldering, whether that's FPGA and PCB design, whether that's um, working out how to run an arcade business and make it self-sustaining so you can get even more out of your hobby and collect even more machines and share that with people. There's, there is a lot to be found um, forward-looking in a retro hobby, I think. What do you guys think? Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there's so many different angles you can come at this hobby, isn't there? Mm. Yeah, for sure. Uh, um, who wants to take the, the next answer from the uh, question of the week? I'll, I'll do it because oh, I, I, I've got a connection to the answer. Okay. Fizgit says, um, I think I'm paused. I haven't the energy or the space to use the machines I've got, but I haven't got to the stage of selling them yet. I got my 520 STFM out in May, tested it, retro it, and he's put a picture of there on. I hope it's a picture of it. Yeah, retro <laughs> it. Oh, it's a picture of the mouse. The mouse. Um, Before and, and after sort of shot. It's sort of half of it. Half the mouse is retro righted, half isn't. And there's a, there's a nice difference. Good job. Yeah. And I put a GoTech in it, and I haven't touched it since. And then later on, he's talking about the the, the it replies. He says it's not about enjoying it; it's about being too burnt out to do it. And I've got a lot of sympathy for that. Sometimes I'm that way. I've not been well this year, and sometimes I, I, I've got lots of things I want to do, but getting around to them and, and so on, especially with space and time and all the rest of it. Sometimes your eyes are bigger than your ability to do it in retro. Um, so yeah, I've got a lot of empathy there for Fisket. It's not about starting a thing in retro, like starting an old game you've always wanted to play or starting to get to know a machine. It's about knowing that when you start it, you've got the time to fully enjoy it and immerse yourself yeah, in it. So true. Uh, and yeah. make that Immersion is important. Yeah. Yeah. I, it, it, sometimes when I go to do something, you sit down, you're thinking, should I not be signing on back at work to catch up on something? Should I not be doing this? Mm -hmm. I could do with tidying the kitchen. There's always something at the back of my mind. Whereas when I was 12 or 13 years old, nothing mattered other than the game. Parents did it all for you. Uh, Chris, do you want to read the third answer? Yep. So from Protect 438, I believe I'm beginning to be uh, in a somewhat saturated stage in my collecting. I was lucky enough to start uh, relatively early in the beginning of the 2000s, so I was able to uh, accumulate the majority of my collection without breaking the bank. It started uh, with the Bread Bing Commodore 64 that I had as a kid and then went from there to those computers that I felt I'd missed out on back in the day. We had a good uh, selection of computer magazines, so quite a, uh, so I knew quite well what had been out there. In a way, my collection could be called a micro bitty magazine collection, which covers <laughs> many of the computers that were reviewed on it. Uh, I no longer have all those computers I've acquired over the years. Some I've passed on one to bitty. other <laughs> one bitty. <laughs> Sorry. Um, some I've passed on what to other bitty. hobbyists, and some I've ended Dave. up buying again. <laughs> After having seller's remorse, I believe I'm on my third or fourth Amiga 500. That's because Amigas are awesome. Um, of course, from time to time, I wonder if I really need five different computers to play C64 games, or could I get by with a single Amiga? If I were to require a new system, should I at least consider letting go of the existing ones? As is, I'm pretty content with my collection, having been able to acquire my Holy Grail machines and some pretty obscure ones. Of course, if an opportunity comes up to grab a vintage system for a reasonable price, be it a rarity or a dime a dozen one, I'll probably jump on it. 
Nice. I do have micro bitty magazines in the library at the cave. Um, ah. Are they Finnish? I think maybe. <laughs> so I can't read them, but um, it's nice to have some uh, representation from other the countries. Bitties. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I just saw, I spotted one further down in the answers from Toxic Seahorse who says, I haven't even started collecting. I just like to live vicariously through YouTubers drooling over hard drives, Amiga 4000s and the like. So there's nothing Good wrong with you. that as well. Um, nice to provide a public service for people who want to enjoy things that way. Um, just quickly, Alex, how would you describe your your position? Where are you on your collecting journey? What kind of a collector would you say you are now? <clears throat> Yeah, I've all, I mean, I've always been collecting. I'm, I'm always considered myself a collector. Um, Are you but, finding you're a kind of a transitional place because you've got a lot of focus on the arcades now, or does is there still a place for your console collection? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the focus has been on that, finding the right games, and I'm always looking for games that I think other people would like for the museum, not just what I would like, you know. So that's always a goal. Pac-Man. Um, <laughs> So, what outrun? He said Pac-Man. No, Pac oh, Pac-Man. Pac-Man. Oh, what? listen to the way he just says the name. <laughs> oh, Pac-Man. He clearly loves Pac-Man. <laughs> you know, I have to get Pac-Man in there because a kid on. Saturday it's not been. It's not been said yet, but the the, the wish. If you write a wish list of people's top arcade games. They're all there. It's ridiculous the machines he's got. I thought you might struggle to get the thing to the place filled with arcade machines at all. Never mind getting it working and never mind having the best ones you could get. But the only thing he's missing is Pac Man, I think. Yeah, well, we could. Yeah. I've got a Miss Pac Man. I can stick that in a jammer cabinet. You have? Well, there you <laughs> yeah. go. Stick it in. That's you done. Exactly. That's better than Pac Man. Exactly. That's what no, I've heard. I, I need to play plan that. To, to, to get a Pac Man machine. We do need one. Um, yeah. But yeah, as far as my collecting yeah. is going, I mean, I'm still buying the odd game. I still like collecting for the Famicom, uh, the PC Engine, PCBs. Still looking out for PCBs, bargains. You know. No change then. No, no change. change at all. No. <laughs> Excellent. But, well, hopefully, hopefully soon you'll see Pac-Man or uh, or its bootleg stuffed bean elf soon ooh. in the arcade. <laughs> um, if you've if you've ever used a Pandora joystick with all the built-in games. Inexplicably, inexplicably, for some reason, um, Pac-Man is called Stuffed Bean Elf. So, and I think I think Dave found Stuffed Bean Elf two recently. Ooh, it's not called Stuffed Bean Elf two. It's called something. Uh, uh, let me find it quickly. Okay. Well, while you do that, I'll ask the next question of the week for this week. So, if you want to participate, uh, you can find the question pinned to our subreddit, reddit.com forward slash r forward slash this week in retro. And the question we're posing to you this week is all about arcades in honor of Alex being here. Quite simply, when you think of an arcade, what's the first machine you think of? What's the one that you made a beeline to play? Or maybe it was the one with the loudest attract sound. Maybe you heard Robocop booming, uh, shouted out across the arcade, or the crashing noise of Outrun and the car flipping over in the attract mode. Or Space Invaders, as Alex described earlier, the loudest of all the arcades. When you think of an arcade, don't think too hard on it. Just what's the first game that comes to mind? Um... We, do, we always like ones that come from personal experience and personal memory. So if you can tag a story to tell us why you think of that one, even better. So you can find that on our subreddit. Dave, fill us in with the Stuffed Bean Elf story. Stuffed Bean Elf 1 and Stuffed Beans, plural, native. Stuffed, stuffed Beans, beans. <laughs> native. Are they both <laughs> on the Do we know Pandora? what game that is? No, is I it, don't know. Is it like it's not, it's not just a list, a list of all the games. There There's go. also Super Cute Beans. And seasoned beans. <laughs> seasoned beans. <laughs> just just uh, before we close up, just thinking of arcade sounds. Um, even before I got into the arcade in Weymouth Seafront, there was one particular arcade. They had the coin pushers just outside with the, um, you know, the what do you call it, pulled out over the top of it to give it some shelter. Um, and it, the coin pushers were always, always on loop all day long playing King of the Swingers from the Jungle Book. Do you know that song? Yeah. Do, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah just just all day on loop and it was jungle just like a VIP. short segment yeah jungle just a short segment of that that song so no matter where you were in the arcade you could always hear this thing on loop damn annoying <laughs> <laughs> anyway thank you as always for for listening uh thank you alex for joining us today if you want to go and see alex and um check out the arcade archive thanks for having us on dot store no rmcretro.com <laughs> forward slash visit 
rmcretro.store for the charity calendar and uh, the subreddit reddit.com forward slash r forward slash this week in retro for everything else take care everyone see you next time bye 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 This Week in Retro was presented by Neil from RMC The Cave, Chris from 005 Agima, and Dave. It was produced by me, Duncan Styles. The podcast version of the show is available through your favourite podcaster, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And the video version is available on the This Week in Retro YouTube channel. Join our community subreddit at r slash thisweekinretro to suggest and vote on the stories we cover on the show. If you watch This Week in Retro on YouTube, please give us a like and subscribe to help us reach new viewers. If you enjoy our show and would like to support it, then please check out the link to our Patreon page in the show notes or description. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time for more up-to-date news for out-of-date tech.